The uh, restoration of antique aircraft is, is quite an art all itself, not only in because you have, have the knowledge and of uh, some of the old 1929, 20, and 30 methods of doing it, but a lot of the products that were used then still have to be used today because the FAA has only certified certain products. And the reason for that is, for example, in the woodworking restoration, According to FAA, nobody does that anymore, so they haven't really done research into newer methods of your epoxy glues, for example. So uh, when we do woodworking restoration, if it's on certified aircraft, we still have to use the same technique and products that was originally used on air aircraft in 1929 or 1930 or whatever it may be. However, the covering situation, originally they were used linen, uh, Irish linen or grade A cotton with what we call dope. Now that technique has improved over the years and now we use synthetic material. And so the covering procedures that we use today, uh, as opposed to what we used 40 years ago, when you cover a fuselage, you may cut off uh, 24 to 48 hours of work and just in putting the cover on alone because of the way the synthetic and the chemicals react. So that has been a big plus for the uh, uh, antique and plastic uh, uh, industry in that new techniques not only make it faster but also make it safer and stronger. And that's what we run into a lot of times. We have to reverse engineering or come up with new techniques that uh, were still compatible with what they did back in the early days because we tried to make these aircraft as much uh, like they were when they were built as possible but still keep them safe. I like to have the feeling of restoring something that's old and putting it back into service. Um, I never liked to see anything destroyed but it's it's good clean work and I've always loved being enthralled with aviation. The aircraft just came to the top as far as uh, restoration. The first time I saw an airplane was probably, I was about six years old, so that's been a few years back in the early 40s. It was a, a Ronnie Kachief and my dad took me for a ride, a barnstormer landing in the alfalfa field close by, and I took a ride, and, and uh, the kind of bug kind of bit me on that. However, during the war years in the 40s, uh, I've seen a lot of B-17s and B-24s, and they enthralled me no end. I just couldn't imagine anything that big flying. So that was my, my career was to get into the military and fly during the war. But the problem was it didn't wait for me. We started Raven Aero Service here about 22 years ago and uh, actually started out as uh, a, a business that does restoration for antique and classic aircraft. Uh, it developed into other areas for its annual inspections and and repair on various aircraft, but primarily we like to stay with the restoration business for the antique aircraft. An important part of what I do right now is keeping updated on the regulations, training in new areas that come up for the restoration work, and helping the new people that want to come and join. And we, we're getting a lot of uh, uh, requests from the younger generation that want to get into the restoration business. And actually, there's not schools around here doing do, do not teach that because there's nobody that can that can teach it. So uh, we get a lot of requests, so we work with the younger generation that way too. When we first started in, in uh, classic and antique, it, it was a question in our minds is how do we get how do we get the jobs to, to cover these? Well, that was answered in very short time because uh, word of mouth gets around real fast in the antique uh, aircraft industry and uh, we did a couple local jobs first, and uh, uh, we started out maybe then our word spread to 100 miles around that we were that we could do this and we're good at what we were doing, hopefully. Uh, I guess our reputation has gone spread far and wide, you might say, and, and uh, we were just fortunate in that aspect of it. So I started out in my Army career uh, in 1957 and, and got into aviation maintenance for the Army, and as I got, when I re Got out of the uh, service while I knew there was a contractor at Fort Riley, and so I applied for work there in 1960, got the job, and stayed there for 32 years. There's just something about uh, the classic and antique aircraft that has a little more romance, if that's the word, to it than, than the, the sheet metal aircraft. Uh, uh, it, it, 
takes a crafts, it's kind of a craftsman type job, uh, but it's interesting and it's clean and, and it's just fun to see something develop and, and using your hands to bring something back to life. Now I have to go back to my times at Marshall Field and it pertains to a beach, twin beach that we had there at the time. This was during the Vietnam War, the start of the Vietnam War when I was out there and we had shipped a lot of the aircraft off to Vietnam so we had nothing but to fly for the general so the Navy gave us a small uh, Navy bomber and they were metal but all the fabric was the, all the flight control surfaces were fabric. Nobody out there knew how to do fabric work. We just had never done it. I had started a little bit of it so I knew about it. So that project fell on me to recover all the control surfaces on the general's airplane. Needless to say, uh, a lot of blood, sweat and tears went into that to make sure it was not a hard job, but to make sure that it came out right because there was a lot of visibility on that aircraft and lo and behold it turned out pretty good as a matter of fact that uh, airplane still sets down at the airport in El Emporia Kansas under a shade tree and the last time I drove by there I looked at the control surface and it still had old trooper painted on the side that I put on there years ago and it brings back old memories I think that project probably helped a lot of getting me started in this in, in, in this dope fabric work. As I say, the first few years, it was hobby. It was a paying hobby, of course. People would, would do this, but uh, most of the work was done in my garages at home. And so it was, it, it took a while to do it. Um, and, and we're finding in, in, uh, in our business today, a lot of the business that we do receive uh, are people who were in a similar situation as I was then. In other words, they want to rest they buy an old airplane, they want to restore it in their spare time, and after five or ten years, they find out their spare time is all being utilized by something else, and the airplane is last. So they contact us and they say, would you finish that project for me? And we do. Of course, we can work on them eight hours a day. So a lot of our, our projects come from people who I know I have a feeling for because I found myself in that same situation many times. The first project I ever did covering on restoration was a 1941 Taylor craft and it was for my brother-in-law. But it was my first complete project I'd done and I wanted to be very well. Uh, we really did more or less start from scratch, but that that first project, you know, that you do the complete thing. We had done some small pieces of aileron flaps and stuff like that, but when you do a first complete project and when it's all done and you see it fly for the first time, it really, really uh, means a lot to you. But the fun involved in that, the satisfaction, and then watching it fly, it just kind of awe-inspiring. I am not a pilot. Uh, I started taking lessons early in my, several years ago, and early in our raising our family. Uh, I was doing work for people and would take some flying time for the work they did. However, it's still become very expensive and very time consuming. And of course, family take top priority. So flying lessons kind of went by the side. But during my maintenance career at Fort Riley, I got to go into a lot of a lot of test flights with our, our test pilots on helicopters and airplanes. So I more than made up for the time in the air and, and actually learned quite a bit about flying helicopters. And um, so really the maintenance aspect of it was more important to me than the flying aspect. Everybody has said, well, where did you come up with the name Raven Aero Service? Well, I said there's a feeling behind that. That's my wife's maiden name, Raven. And I've always thought that was a beautiful name. So. Our company is Raven Aero Service, and uh, I think it's meant a lot to her too. I guess everybody in, in, their, in their own field of work likes to be recognized by their peers. Awards is one good way of doing that. We are in our own uh, FAA, Federal Aviation District here, and there's nine districts in the United States. Uh, ours is the, the office in Wichita. And in our line of work here with restoration, we do come in contact with the people out of the FISDO office in Wichita quite a bit. 
And over the 50 years I've worked with that office down there, I have never received anything but top-notch professional work out of that office. And so when it came time for recognition, I guess, uh, I guess it's payback part on their time. So uh, they uh, put my name in for a couple of two or three of the awards. And, and to me, it, it's, uh, it makes you feel as you enter the twilight maybe of your career that uh, it, it gives you something now physically to, to look at and think back uh, uh, how that developed and how you got these awards. The one award here that you see is called the uh, uh, Charles Taylor Master Mechanic Award. And that means a lot because you have to have 50 years in aviation maintenance to get to be eligible for that award. So that means quite a bit to me. Now, Charles Taylor, as you may know, was the mechanic for Orville and Wilbur Wright. And so the Federal Aviation has designated this not only as a, as a, a remembrance maybe for the work he did, but also to recognize people who have been in the business for a long time and still are. Two of the awards, this one, and the one on the end there are a conjunction more or less as a result of the Charles Taylor Award, and that is that they are the Regional Maintenance Technician of the Year Award for this region. We are in the central region here, FAA Central Region, which includes seven states here. There are nine various regions in the United States, and so there's competition for the regional award. The FAA makes that decision. Those nine finalists from each region, now they compete for, for what is called the uh, FAA Aviation Maintenance Technician of the Year. And that award is given out at the big fly-in at Oshkosh, Wisconsin each year. And so of the nine, I was selected as the top maintenance technician of the year, went up to Oshkosh and received this award from the FAA director at that time. Now that's quite a thrill, and uh, it, it just it kind of cements the feeling that you have about the aviation uh, field, how wonderful it is, uh, the benefits of it, and actually people who don't know that much about it uh, in, the, in the career are, are eager to talk and understand more about it. So um, it's a big thrill for me, and as I say, it's also always a thrill to be recognized by your peers in some way or another. There are a lot, many, many, many people that I have to thank for this, and I think I mentioned a few with the FISDO office down in Wichita and around the country who I've been associated with for the last 50 years. They, they have done a lot to make sure then and get my uh, recognition for that. However, I think at the top of that list, I'd have to go with my wife, Jan. She uh, has been the wind beneath my wings for 56 years. And of course, uh, without that support, uh, this just wouldn't have happened at all. And, and my son John has been very instrumental over the last few years in development of this project too. I think my family, my wife and son, and the rest of my family has been the top-notch people that have, have, uh, should take responsibility for these awards too. We had been speaking about some of the projects in the 29 and 30 category and one of the things you run into on that is the age of the wood and the condition of it. And as you can see from this wing, that 1929 has been stored for several years and so it has deteriorated uh, beyond serviceable means. However, we have to use it all for a pattern because of that age we have nothing else to go by. As we had mentioned, all the wood in here, the glue is all Stitka spruce. Everything is there and we have to go back originally. Take one of the ribs and use it as a pattern and make our own ribs using the same glue and the same wood as what was on the original wing. And so it's very time consuming. But when you come out, you come out with an airplane that looks just like it did when it was built in 1929. Wood, glue, nails, everything. So that is the story on that wing. Now, this is the same wing on the other side that we are starting to look at for manufacturing a new one. This is the, the spars, the main spars, and as we said before, they're made out of Stitka spruce. They're beautiful wood. You probably wouldn't want to buy 
build a house from them because the cost would be very prohibitive. About $14 is running foot for this wood. But it's beautiful, stout, lightweight wood, and it was used extensively on these light aircraft throughout the ages. So this is what we're doing here. We have them laid out beside the old spars, uh, which came off the wing, which we disassembled for parts. The metal parts that were are part of that wing are all bead blasted and checked for condition. And a lot of times we find that the condition is such that we have to make new ones. And that's where John becomes a critical area in here because of, with his, with his uh, experience and education, he's able to manufacture and duplicate a lot of this stuff just like it actually was. This is an example of what we're talking about on, on the new synthetic type covering that we're using on there. It's called Seconite. And, and it's a lot different, from, of course, from the original Irish linen or grade A cotton that we use on. This is more into your Dacron type finish here. In other words, when we first were covering the, when it came to shrinking this tight, uh, the dope, a nitrate dope would shrink that, but it would take four or five days to get it shrunk down. With this new type of uh, synthetic material here, we glue it on, we take your average, just a kitchen iron, set it at various degrees up to 350 degrees and start an ironing. So we can have this all ironed out in a half a day where before it would take four or five days to get that in the same condition this is here. So the use of the synthetic material has been a big improvement for classic uh, restoring these aircraft. And, it, and it's a lasting material, it'll last longer than the grade A cotton. If it's properly hangered and, and taken care of, it will last a lot longer. So that has been a vast improvement on, on uh, covering. So another part of restoration, of course, we're talking about is the woodwork. This is my son, John, and he, as I said, he is a mechanical engineer, and so we've, it's fall on him to come up with ways to make improvements on the uh, old techniques and also to come up with and make them look exactly like they used to. Here we're in the process of laying out to make new ribs uh, for the wing over there and so it's a craftsman type job and John has taken on that responsibility and does a wonderful job of it. This is one of the other aspects of our work we do here. We talked about restoration of some of the antiques and classics, but we also do some work with the experimental categories. And that a lot of time has led to damage, uh, not only in experimental, but also in the other category. So this is an aircraft that has been damaged and we are uh, restoration and repair together. And, uh, Tyler is, is right now preparing this to be recovered. It's a fabric airplane. Getting everything straightened out and rigged up and back together again is quite a, quite a chore to do. But this is one of the things we do also besides just antique and classic is the uh, restoration to wrecks and or some of the other experimental aircraft. One of the projects we had mentioned earlier that uh, begins in somebody's garage at home and winds up in our shop about 10 years later. This is a 1929 Inland Sport, which you had seen the wings on before. They had started doing a fuselage and did a pretty good job on it. However, when it got down to five or six or eight years down the road, it becomes, well, I know I'm not gonna get this done, so could you finish it for me? And this is one of our projects that we, can you finish it for me? And we get a lot of those, but we love it. This is a, has been very well taken care of, so it's not gonna be a big thing once we get the wings done. Very good little airplane, it was built in 1929 in Kansas City, Missouri, and there's only about seven of them left in the world. So on a situation like that, we take a little extra care because uh, when they get few and far between, uh, they mean so much more to us in the, in the antique and classic. We, we hate to see a, a model completely disappear, so we take a little extra care. So we're always happy to get projects like this that says, well, I started this, but I'm not gonna get it done. Can you finish it for me? And we do. This is our EA experimental aircraft hangar. Uh, we have a lot to do with the kids in here, but we, we also uh, have allow our members to work on aircraft projects that they have. Two of our members in our EAA membership group here 
uh, have had this. It's a L3, a Ronkin L3, converted to a World War II liaison airplane. And it has been hanging around for years. And so we let the REA members bring these things in here and work on them under our authority and, and teach them how to do it, show them what they're doing right and wrong, and let them do the work. And that's what's happened here. They've done a beautiful job on this. This airplane probably would not have been in the stage you see it right now had it not been for allowing them to uh, do the work in here under our guidance. It's going to be flyable again, and, and that's what it's all about when you talk about antiques and classic, is getting these birds up in the air again. Now here's a project that doesn't really look like too much, but it is a Piper Tri-Pacer. We have a kids aviation youth maintenance education program here, and it all started during the early part of the first Iraq war, when a lot of the fathers and mothers of the children here were over there in Iraq, and on Saturdays, they didn't have nothing to do. So we kind of took them under our wing and said, why don't you come out and let's build a, let's work on airplane. We started building a uh, fly baby, uh, which never got completed, of course, but it gave us something to do and keep the kids occupied, get their minds off of where their, their parents was. Well, that has developed now into a bigger thing. And now we're into this type of an airplane and we hope to have it completed in maybe year and a half, two years, and, and also set up a young eagles program where they learned to use this aircraft to fly. One of the other things we developed in conjunction with the young eagles here in the project working on the airplanes is this flight simulator. Uh, we got the plans uh, out of a magazine or internet for it and we decided this might be an interesting project for the young kids to do too. So we built this and with a computerized system up there, and it is a full axis uh, trainer. In other words, whatever you do with a stick, you do with this thing here. You have rudder pedals, and whatever the aircraft if you do here, the aircraft on the screen does the same thing. This has been an interesting part of our Saturday mornings. Uh, it not only gives the kids something to do, but it gives them a little insight into actually what it takes to fly an airplane. And that's what we're all about. We want to get these kids interested, like I say, not only in maintenance, but in the flying aspect of it too. And this has been a tremendous asset to our group. A lot of people today want to get into the classic antique aircraft ownership part of it. And there are a lot of aircraft out there that have been restored that are for sale. Uh, the, the market in the last few years has has gone down. It's, it's a buyer's market, in other words, due to the fact the cost of fuel on some of these, and some of these old birds will burn a lot of gas. So a lot of people still want to get into it, and, and so you they, they question, they come up and they say, what, what should I be looking for? Because there's a lot of these small aircraft on the market that are flyable, uh, that maybe cost in the fifteen to $20,000 range. Now they say, I want you to completely restore that, and you're talking maybe twenty-five to 35000 to restore it. People are putting a lot more money into restoration than what they can get out of it if they were to sell it. But a lot of our customers are under the thought that I'm not going to sell it. I'm going to fly it. It's a beautiful airplane. I've always wanted to own one. I'm going to fly it. I'll let my estate take care of it when it comes time to sell it. So that is a lot of, it just depends on what, how you look at it. If, you're, if, if your thought is to buy an, a damaged old anti, old classic aircraft, restore it and sell it and make money, that's probably not going to happen in the market today. You know, I've asked myself several times, and a lot of people have too, said, how long are you going to keep doing this? And when are you going to retire? Well, I've retired twice. I guess it's the third time it might be a charm, but as long as my health lets me do it, uh, they don't kick me out. I, I plan on being a part of this uh, restoration, maintenance aspect of the business for, you know, maybe another year or two. Just kind of see. Now there again, the market may dictate uh, another situation. It may become so expensive that uh, owners cannot get their work done. So if, if it starts falling off, why? We may look at different areas of it and get into different business, but as long as it's, as long as it's uh, productive uh, for us and uh, uh, we can 
get some income off of. We enjoy doing it. Um, I plan on doing it as long as I can.